Revelation chapter 13, and we'll look at verses 11 to the end of the chapter this evening. Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 to the end of the chapter. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performed great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it was allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it de deceived those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also it caused all those, all both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand and the forehead so that the one so that no one could buy or sell unless he has the mark that is the name of the beast or the number of its name this calls for wisdom let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of a man and his number is 666. That's for the reading of God's Word. Let us pray and ask God to help us also to comprehend this this evening. Father God, we are well aware of the fact that these words are some of the most difficult words in Scripture. We are well aware, Father, that there are so many different opinions about this. But Father, we do not seek the opinions of men. And yet, Father, we are only mere men ourselves. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit will help us and guide us in the truth, for your name's sake. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight we consider the second of the two beasts that are discussed in this chapter. The first beast which we looked at last week was a beast who raised, who was raising from, from the sea. And we, we heard that that beast represents the governments of this world who form to fight against the church of God. And so these governments which were instituted by God for the purpose of peace and justice, then turned against God's people and became the servants of Satan. They oppressed, and they came to oppress the church and to persecute and to kill those who are the children of God. And so we saw last week that, that the government's, this first beast was the greatest weapon of Satan against the church. So tonight we come to the second beach which rises from the earth. This beast is a master of disguise, presenting itself to be something that it's not. And by doing so, it draws people away from God. And if possible, it would even do that with God's elect. And so we have to understand that this is a, a dangerous instrument in the hands of Satan, and yet we meet it so often. So let us consider this evening the, the beast rising from the earth to see false religion as Satan's instrument 
against the church. And in doing that, we're going to look at three thoughts about this beast that rises from the earth. The first thing I want us to see regarding this beast is its appearance and deceit in verse 11. Its appearance and deceit. We see that this beast only has two horns, not ten horns like the previous one. And it presents itself like a lamb. But yet when it opens its mouth, it, it speaks in the voice of a dragon. And so while it presents itself as an angel of light, in reality it is a demon of darkness. It may look innocent and gentle, and yet it is filled with lies and deceit. It is a wolf in sheep's clothing. And it represents then all forms of false doctrine, whether it be teaching or false religions or the false philosophies of this world, every form of falsehood which is proclaimed or taught in our dispensation. And the intention of teaching these falsehoods is to infiltrate people's minds and to convince them that what is false is true. It is, the, the, it is this beast that brought us, for instance, the doctrine of evolution. It is this beast that brought us the thoughts that man can be woman and woman can be man. It is this beast that has brought us to the point where we have come into a society that believe that it's not killing a baby when they take a baby out of the womb and kill it. It is this beast that has brought us atheism and all the different forms of new age thinking of our age. It is this that brought false religions, all the religions of this world except for Christianity, which is false and comes from Satan. This is where it comes from, from this beast. It has also brought us every false teaching that we hear in churches where people twist the truth and turn it into a lie. And so this presents itself, this beast presents itself even as the Lamb of God, and yet it is the servant of Satan. And Paul speaks about false teachers in Second Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 13 and 14. And what does he say? He says, For such men are, such men are false apostles, defeat, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So, so it is no surprise that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond with their deeds. And so Jesus tells us something about them as well. He says in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. As such, we see then that this is indeed a very dangerous and effective instrument in the hands of Satan, don't we? They will come with convincing and seemingly true stories. They will come dressed well, presenting themselves as proclaimers of the truth. They will come and they will wrap their lives, their lies in, in the truth. They will tell us the things that we would like to hear. They will present themselves as valiant for the truth, as people who do good while they are filled with evil. And so the point is, their true intentions is not clearly seen. They are masters of disguise. I've often wondered why people are so easily persuaded by false teachings and false doctrines. I mean, how can anybody believe in evolution? And here's the answer, because they want to disprove the existence of God. 
They don't want to believe in God because the moment they believe in God, they are bound to His law to do what He tells them to do. How can anybody approve of abortion? Well, it's very easy when you've convinced yourself that that's not human life. And that human life is not sacred. How can anybody believe the false religions of this world? Well, the reason why people so easily believe them is because ultimately it is the natural desire of every man to determine his own destiny, isn't it? And through all the false religions of this world, it is my work that determines where I will end up. It's not so. It's not determined on a Savior who is outside of me, who I have no control over. Why do people run to to false prophets and the false teachings that we hear in in various so-called churches? And the reason is because these people offer them entertainment. They give them what they want. They, they tell them what they want to hear. Paul Washer said that false, false teachers offer people exactly what Satan offered Jesus in the desert. All of these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. These teachings come and offer you the world, but what they give you is a dung hill. They offer you life and liberty, but then they direct you straight to eternal damnation. This is the beast of the earth, and, and James says that this beast of the earth indeed offers us wisdom, but it's not true wisdom. Listen to what James says in James chapter 3 and verse 15. He says, this is not the wisdom that comes from above. It is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Paul says that their end is clearly known. Those who follow earthly demonic wisdom. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 19, Paul says, Their end is destruction. Their gods are their bellies. And they have, and their glory in their shame. With their minds set on earthly things. Brother and sister, beware of an earthly mindset. Be careful of worldly advice. Be careful of following the desires of your own sinful heart. Because these things are not from God. They are attempts by Satan to drag you away from God. They may seem good. They may seem helpful. But really what they are trying to do is to replace God in your life. Let us come to God's word and find our guide and rule for our lives in nothing else but God's word. It brings us to our second point, and that is his authority and ability. His authority and ability, verse 12 to 15. In verse 12, we see that this beast exercises the authority of the first beast. Now, What that means is that they are working towards the same purpose. They have the same task at hand. And they work together at times to destroy the church and to destroy the believers by working together at times. Now this was the case in in the first century. Remember the first beast now is the governments of the world. The second beast is all the false religions or false teachings and various other forms of falsehood that is proclaimed in this world. In the, New, in the New Testament times, in the time of the first century, the priests of the heathen were friends with those in government. And the result of that is that they had influence. They influenced the people of government in certain ways. But not only that, they also supported the orders that government gave. We see this actually very much shown to us, in fact, as the Jewish leaders worked together with the government of Rome. 
in killing our Lord. Can we forget those words of the Jewish people shouting out, we have no king but Caesar. Imagine that. Now, I know often when we think of false religion and the state, we think that these two things are opposed to each other. They don't work together. But, but let me remind you how often and how many countries throughout the world there is a state religion or a state church. Think of the Russian Orthodox Church. And let me say the Russian Orthodox Church, there's very little Christian about them. In fact... True Christians in Russia and Siberia are killed and persecuted daily. Think of the Roman Catholic Church, which is a state church in many countries, and now that church has forsaken the truth for the sake of human tradition. That they follow the words of a godless man who calls himself the Pope. And think of our own country, where the state church approved of apartheid, and not just approved of it, but even justified it through the Bible. Let us see that false religion and false teachers are the servant of Satan and often works together with the governments of this world. Let us be careful. Think of how many countries today call themselves secular countries. And yet what they teach is unbiblical. What they teach goes directly against what the Word of God teaches. There are clear indications that both false religion and governments get their orders from the same place. Can you see that? And that they often work together. But they say the same mindset, the same way that they are going. And then the passage tells us that they also do signs, this beast does signs and wonders. And the purpose of doing these things are to deceive those who dwell on the earth. We often see, don't we, how people run after signs and wonders. People want to be entertained. They base their religion not on the truth, but on their emotions and on their feelings. And they think that they serve God by doing this. And actually, as Paul says, they're really just serving their their, their bellies. They are just serving themselves. They, They run after their own desires. Those who follow follow these forms of religion would often say to us, won't they? They say to us, truth divides. Let's get rid of the truth. Let us not speak about truth. Let us not speak about doctrine. That's often what they say. And it's interesting, I was listening to a sermon by Ashley Sproul this week, and I'm paraphrasing what he says, but he says, yes, it's true. Doctrine does divide. In fact, it's divided right from the beginning because remember in the Garden of Eden when Satan came to Eve and he said to her, did God actually say that you shall not eat of the fruit of the garden, of any of the fruit in the garden? That's false religion for you. That's false doctrine. That's not what God said. It was a lie. And so, yes, true doctrine doctrine does divide. It divides between the truth and the lie. And it should continue to do so. If we do not stand on doctrine, we will go astray. We have to hold on to something, on to the truth, so that we will not be those who fall, fall prey to the ways of Satan to draw us away from from God. We must love the truth and not love signs and wonders because signs and wonders are not the indication of the fact that those who do them speak the truth. Jesus himself told us this. 
In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21 to 23, remember what he said. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father. Now that we looked at last week, or we considered something of that last week. On that day, many will say to me, Jesus says further, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do many mighty works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Signs and wonders are not a sign that people who do them tell the truth. Jesus told us that. So either they are lying, or Jesus is lying. You decide. Let us not be deceived, brothers and sisters. We should not be those who are interested in these signs and wonders. We should be only interested in God's word and persevering in the truth and preserving the truth. Those who love signs rather than God's word are the children of Satan, not the children of God. The true children of God seek God and and His word. They love obedience. They desire to be more obedient. I hope that you can see that false religion as an instrument of Satan against the church, when I say that, I use the term false religion very loosely to include all forms of human social um, teachings. That anything that separates itself or even contradicts the word of God. All of that is included in the second beast. And so the second beast, the passage tells us, gets his authority and instruction from the same place as the first beast. They sometimes work together. They always work towards the same goal, and that is to destroy the truth and destroy the church and destroy the believers. And they will do whatever they can find, and they will offer people whatever they want in order to do so. But they will never pay what they offer, because they are deceivers. Be careful, because these churches and these religions and these theories of the world sounds very they sound very very much as if they are good and legit they present themselves to be something that they are not if you go or attend a church where the focus is more on pleasuring people than obeying God then be careful If people like the sizzle but they hate the steak, or rather if they like the entertainment but they hate the truth, be careful. Because it's not from God. It is worldly, and if it is worldly, it is demonic. That's what James told us, not so. Brings us to our third and final point. The mark His mark and his number, verse 16 to 18. His mark and his number. These last words of our chapter speaks about those who dwell on the earth, about both small and great, about both rich and poor, about both free and slaved. And, And these people are marked. They are marked with the mark of the beast on their right hand and on their forehead. Right hand and forehead. And this enables them to buy and sell, which implies that those who do not have this mark are not able to buy or sell. And the mark of the beast then is the number of its name. That's what we are told. Now I suspect that This is probably the one passage in the book of Revelation that we hear of the most. In fact, this morning, um, Erika told me 
that Nike is bringing out new shoes. Now, I'm basing this solely on the fact that I saw one article. I haven't confirmed whether this is actually true, but that they are bringing out a shoe of which they will only sell 660 pairs. On the side of it, it's got Luke chapter 10 and I think verse 18. And into the soul, there's a, a red liquid pull pushed in, and in that red liquid is a single drop of human blood. This is the shoes of the beast by implication. Many, many books have been wasted. Many attempts have been made to try and explain this specific passage. Many true believers have been driven to fear because of thoughts and impressions given to people by about what this means. I mean, even recently, some had said that this vaccine will be the mark of a beast, that it will be injected into your right hand and it will implant a chip into your forehead or something like that. But we have to understand, none of this is true. This is all fear-mongering by people who try and promote themselves. They are trying to make a name for themselves. This is not based on the teachings of Scripture. These thoughts are not those... Not the thoughts of those who study the Word of God. These are the, the thoughts of people who make up their own impressions of what it means. And so let us be clear that we, we do not want the impressions of men. We don't, we don't lead, seek for human thoughts on what this means. We want to study God's Word and try and allow God's Word to teach us what this is relating to. If anyone is to help us to understand what this means, let it be God who shows us what this means. And so let us get our mind into the Bible. Let us have a biblical mindset as we come to this particular passage. And let us remind us firstly, remind ourselves that revelation often uses numbers. And the intention of using these numbers are to help us as humans to understand something which is actually only known by God. And so let us focus our attention firstly on a single phrase in that last verse which is often missed by people. Most people don't read this or consider it when they read that last verse. And it's these words, for it's, it is the number of a man. Or otherwise translated, it is a human number. And the meaning of that phrase is to tell us that this is, this number is to help us to comprehend something which is only really known by God. I can give you a number of other examples in the book of Revelation where, where John uses human numbers to try and help us to understand something which is only known to God. Let me give you the first example. Is there anybody who knows when the Lord Jesus will return? Of course not. The Bible itself tells us, and Jesus tells us, that nobody knows except the Father. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36, it says, But concerning that day and, and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. In fact, when Jesus' disciples asks him on the day of his ascension about these things, what does he say to them? Acts chapter 1 and verse 7 and 8, he says, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father had fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So in other words, what's Jesus saying to them? 
Jesus is saying to him, stop bothering about the date when I will return. And get busy serving the Lord by sharing the gospel. Can I say that again? Stop bothering to try and find out when Jesus Christ is coming and spend time serving the Lord, sharing the gospel. That's why we are here. But we waste hours and hours and times and times in order to find out when Jesus is coming. And we are neglecting the very thing that Jesus told us to do. Why we are here. Why He has left us here. And so we have no idea how long it's going to be before Christ comes again. And by implication, we don't know what is the time delay between Christ's first coming and second coming. Am I right? We don't know. Only God knows. And yet, John comes and gives us a human number to help us understand in Revelation 11. He tells us that it's going to be three and a half years or 46, 42 months or 1,260 days. And of course we know those numbers are symbolic because if they were not symbolic, those days have long gone, isn't it? Three and a, day, three and a half years after Jesus' ascension has long gone. It's the very same time frame, so by the way, as a thousand years of Revelation chapter 20. It's all symbolic. And why does John use this number? It is to show us that it relates to some extent approximately to the three and a half years of Jesus' earthly ministry. And so it's a human number to help us understand firstly that there is time going to pass between Jesus' first coming and second coming, but then also to tell us that we should be doing what Christ was doing. We should be ministering instead of worrying about how long it's going to be before He comes. Secondly, Revelation also uses number to help us with another problem. And that is the problem that we don't know exactly how many people the Lord is going to save. We don't know how many are God's elect. We don't know the number of them. And Paul tells Timothy and Jesus tells his disciples that no one knows except God the exact number, how many the exact number of Jesus' followers are who will be saved. John tells us that it's going to be a great crowd. In Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9, he says it's going to be a great multitude that no one could number, and yet three verses before he numbered them and told us that it's 144,000. Why for a moment would we think that 144,000 is an exact number? It's not. John himself tells us three verses later it's not an exact number. But he gives us this number so that we can understand that it will indeed be a great number. A number so great that nobody could ever count them. And so we find such numbers all over the book of Revelation, like, for instance, the number seven, seven churches and seven trumpets and seven seals, etc., etc. It, in, it implies a perf- number of perfect, a perfect number or a complete number. We often find the number thousand, which implies completeness or totality. We often find the number 12 and 24 in the book of Revelation speaking about the people of God. And so what does this number 666 mean? What does it mean? What is it all about? Well, for us to understand, we first have to go back to Revelation chapter 7 and verse 3. And and what we find there is God sealing his own people on their forehead with a seal. And what is that seal that God gives us? It relates to Deuteronomy chapter 6, six and verse 4 to six, uh, four to 9, in particular verse 8. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 and onwards is the Jewish Shema. It's that 
short little prayer that the Jewish people repeat six times, five times a day, sorry. They did that all the time from history. They still do it today. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, with all your might. And then they are told in Deuteronomy chapter 6 that they have to keep this in their heart. They are told that they must teach this to their children. They are teach that they have to talk about this when they're in their houses and when they go out, when they just before they go to bed and when they wake up in the morning, they have to remind themselves of this great truth. And then it comes to verse 8, which relates to our passage here. And you shall bind it as a sign on your hand, and you shall, and it shall be as a frontlet between your eyes. And so that's what the people of God are sealed with. God places His seal on His children. What is the seal? It is their obedience. The sign that we are truly saved is in how we live. In what we think and in what we do. And the same is true of those who are the worshippers of the beast, the false believers who run after false teachings and thereby serve Satan. The sign that is given to them is related to what they think and what they do. The way they live. They live for themselves. They love evil. They hate the truth and anyone who speaks it. The mark of the beast, the mark with which they are marked, is given to them so that we as humans can understand who they are. Because we don't know their number, do we? It is a human number so that we ourselves can comprehend and see who they are. We see the way they live and we know that these are not those who follow the ways of God. The mark of the beast is not something external which has to be placed on us or in us. It is the fruit of a heart that is not set on the things of God. But are set on the things of the beast. It is seen on their hands in what they do. It is seen on on their foreheads, foreheads in the way that they think. And those who do not have this mark of the beast by implication, has the seal of God. And they are unable to buy or sell, the passage tells us, which means that we will suffer for the sake of Christ. It simply means that we will be oppressed and persecuted and killed because we do not conform to the ways of this world. And so if you want to draw any significance out of the number 666, then let me just say this, that if you want to draw any significance from it, just see that it falls short of a 777. Seven being the perfect number and six falls short of that. It misses the mark. And therefore those who have the number 666 are those who miss the mark. They are those who fall short of the glory of God and remain in that falling short state. They live in their sin. While those who are sealed by God are numbered 777. Why? Not because we are perfect within ourselves, but because we have been made righteous through Christ. However, Let us for a moment just think, what what occupies your mind? What 
What does your actions tell us? Do they tell me, do they tell us that you have been conformed to the image of this world? Or does it tell us that you have been transformed by the renewal of your mind? Does it tell us that you are indeed one of God's sealed? Or that you are one which who carries the, the mark of the beast? Now I know that we are not perfect, none of us are. But do you strive, do you desire to become more righteous? Are you becoming more holy? Because those who love the Lord will do what the Lord asks them, and they are saved. But those who love this world will be destroyed. And while those who love the Lord will face many troubles and tribulations in this life, let us persevere because we know that this short moment of affliction will be worth it. I want us to consider one of the most effective persons, instruments in the hand of this beast. person who apparently has the largest congregation in all the world, Joel Alstein. Joel Alstein says, you can have your best life now. And you know that he's right. You can have your best life now. But only if in the next life you're going straight to hell. Which is where you go if you should follow his teaching. Jesus himself said quite the opposite. In John chapter 16 and verse 33, in this world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome this world. If you run after the pleasures of this world, if you, if you follow the religions of this world, let me tell you, those things are demonic. They are from Satan. And it's time that we speak the truth, even against those who call themselves our brothers, but are teaching a different gospel. If your religion is heavenly, it will come with trials and temptations and tribulations, but it will end in salvation, not in destruction. Be watchful, for deceitful, pleasurable, fleshly doctrines of Satan. Because he controls the false religions, he controls the false teachers, he controls the false philosophies of this world. They are his servants against the church. Let us, therefore, instead of focusing on the falseness around us, focus our hearts and minds on the Word of God, which is the truth forever. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that your Word is truth. That we will not live by bread alone, but from, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Help us to be faithful to your word. Help us to turn our eyes and our hearts against any teaching that does not come from you. And that includes so many things, Father, 
even many things and comes of the mouths of those who call themselves part of the church of God. That includes so many things, all of the philosophies of this world, which which they try and impress us and to buy us, to show us that they are really good, when indeed all of their intentions for us is bad and evil. Help us to love you more, and to love your word, and to drown ourselves in it, to meditate on it day and night, so that we will know what is true. And that we will stand for what is true. Help us to do this in Jesus' name. Amen.